Hello and welcome back to the channel. My name's Ed, your friendly neighborhood doctor, and today, another episode of Scrubs. This is season one, episode seven, called My Super Ego. And be sure to watch to the end, because we're gonna give this a realism rating and pick out our favorite WTF moment of the week. Let's check it out. Let's start off with a toughie. Who can- oh -ho -ho! It's another Dr. Kelso ward round, straight out the gate. Only got two out of three last time, so let's, uh, let's see if we can get this one. Help Over the me. last few weeks, the most amazing thing has happened. I've been nailing rounds. I think I'm actually starting to separate myself from the pack. So the answer is Beck's triad. I didn't even hear the question. <laughs> I have no idea what Beck's triad is, so I would definitely have got it wrong. Thank God I didn't have to answer it. Googling Beck's triad. I do know what Beck's triad is. Easy to, <laughs> easy to say once you've just looked it up. I should have known what this was, but it's an indication the patient may have cardiac tamponade. So this is where you get fluid or blood around the heart that compresses the heart and stops it filling. And so the things you get are low blood pressure. You get distended jugular veins because the heart isn't able to fill. So that blood backs up and you also get muffled heart sounds. So the fluid around the heart means you can't hear the heart as well. So that's what Beck's triad is. Good revision for me. You know, it's it's okay to be impressed by me. Most girls are. The only problem with reaching the top is that sooner or later, someone starts nipping at your heels. For me, that's your- Wow, doing chest compressions on a patient on an ambulance trolley. Yeah, I mean, when people come in with a cardiac arrest or they've just had a cardiac arrest in the ambulance, that is how they come in. Increasingly more in out of hospital cardiac arrest, patients come in strapped to a Lucas device. So that's a machine that basically does the chest compressions for you. So that's the guy who wants to take me down. Of course you're gonna have a scar, Peter. I mean, you're not getting any surgery, but chicks dig scars, so I think I'm gonna give you one anyway. <laughs> That's, uh, I'm, I might use that one next time I'm in pediatrics. Peter's drug rash is getting a lot worse. Uh, no problem, just give him prednisone and Benadryl. Also. Good bedside manner. <laughs> so the young chap has a drug rash. I think that might be a bit of a thing that might come back later on because you got, a, you got a young chap on oxygen with a drug rash. We've just assumed that the rash is from that. We probably have to rule out other causes of the rash that are a bit more sinister. The other night, I'm at a restaurant and this guy starts choking. They asked if anyone was a doctor. I didn't even move. Yeah, I know. I still feel like I'm seven years old playing mash with my older brother. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is textbook imposter syndrome, something I can totally relate to. Even being qualified almost eight years now, I still think, am I allowed to do this? Good tea dog. Whoa, what's that smell? I don't know. Did you nick the colon? No. I mean, I don't know. I, I... Right, so they're doing some abdominal surgery here. So we hear they've gone through the peritoneum. The peritoneum is the lining of the abdominal cavity. So you go through the skin, the soft tissue, through the muscle, and then through the lining of the peritoneum. So then you can see the bowel. They're smelling some feces here. So this could be the contents of the colon, the contents of the bowel. So the danger here is that they've nicked the bowel. So caused an incision into the bowel that they didn't want to do. And so the gut contents would now leak into the abdominal cavity, which is supposed to be sterile. So having all that, all that bacteria going in there can cause an infection. The good news is though, they actually figured out the issue so they can repair it, hopefully just with some simple stitches rather than figuring it out that they've made a mistake a few days later when the patient becomes unwell and peritonitic and septic. Cut the music. You know, I kind of had a thing. Yeah, so we said this in one of the previous episodes when there's music playing in the theatre and the shit hits the fan or should I say the shit hits the peritoneum, the music goes out, it's full concentration. So that's pretty realistic. Ah, if it isn't the brain trust. Someone tell me what this patient's rash is. Oh, okay, here we go. A rash, 
and a chance for redemption. So we have a unilateral rash, so one side of the body, mainly on the cheek and neck. I mean, my first question would really be if this rash has brought the patient into hospital, because that's a totally different scenario because they've got a systemic thing wrong with them to mean they were acutely unwell to bring them in as well as the rash. So that would be definitely more concerning, but just taking the rash on its own, I'm gonna go with shingles. So a herpes zoster infection of the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve. It's not a perfect distribution. Although this rash doesn't typically look like shingles, you'd normally get pustules. So individual spots that erupt with some pus, but I think that's what might be going on. Something. It's erythema migrans. Then why don't you just answer it? Everyone looks up to you. It's important to them that you don't get stopped. Besides, come on, it's important to you too. Please, like he knows me. It's a erythema migran, sir. Right you are, Dr. Dolly. <sighs> that was way off. Erythema migrans, that would have been tough to guess. I'm sure there's dermatologists at home watching with their heads in their hands. So this is a rash you get quite early on actually in Lyme disease. So a disease you get from being bitten with a tick that has the bacteria Borrelia in it and that can cause the symptoms. So that would mean that the patients probably come in with symptoms of Lyme disease and then they've discovered this rash as well. So Maybe I should have thought more about <laughs> rashes that also cause systemic problems that would mean you end up in hospital. I don't know where that smell came from. Uh, sir? What is it, do you see something? Sir, I farted. That smell is from the fart that I made. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, I sort of saw that coming, but I didn't want to ruin it. He so should have admitted that a little bit earlier that the smell wasn't from the patient's bowel, very much from the Todd's bowel. The hell out of my OR. <laughs> <Yes, sir. laughs> I mean, that's fair enough. I know that you need to pick an intern to co-write that case report on postpartum hemolytic. Yeah, sure. Congratulations. Now, go. Mission accomplished. Hey, buddy. How are you? Uh, Dr. Cox. I was wondering if I could co-write that case report with you. Yeah, what? this is certainly a side of medicine. As well as doing your clinical job to seeing patients, there's also an expectation for you to do some research work or some quality improvement projects. So you're always on the lookout for opportunities to do that. Generally, that doesn't involve trampling on your peers because usually consultants and the hospital itself has several projects on the go that they actually really want people to be involved with. And it's often a requirement or sometimes gives you extra points when you're applying for certain jobs too. Although it's not all good news, you generally have to find your own time to be able to do these research projects and they can be pretty time consuming, especially with an already quite demanding workload. Dr. Turk, you can make the incision now. Sir, um, my hand's tightening up. I must be low on potassium. All right, I'll take over. I think in golfing, they called this the yips, didn't they? I think uh, Turk's getting surgical yips. Attendance at my new conferences has been very disappointing. In fact, I've begun to wonder if maybe you have something more important to do. Maybe you feel the need to sneak off and have a little nappy nap. I love nappy naps. Or maybe you've forgotten that my conferences are mandatory. <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing because this kind of passive aggressive sort of talk from management it's pretty realistic. I think despite doctors being professionals, you would be pretty surprised about some of the way we get treated. You see, Dr. Dorian, your problem is you're a pansy. <laughs> if you were in my way, I'd throw you off this ledge right now. We're out here alone. No one would ever know. <laughs> So sometimes when you're treated by management is bad, but <laughs> it's never, never quite this bad. Dr. Murdoch, Peter's developed a high grade fever and a cough. No problem, just give him ceftazidine one gram IV. How do you stay so positive? See, now we've got fever and a cough. 
So fever, systemic symptom. And this is particularly bad because the nurse has told him three times that there's been a deterioration and a change in symptoms of the patient. He still hasn't assessed them. And this time he's happily just given a verbal order to prescribe some keflosporin, so a broad spectrum antibiotics. So he's clearly thinking there's an infection going on. At that point, you need to do some additional blood tests and a, a proper assessment of the patient. Nick? His blood cultures don't look good at all. No problem. Okay, so as we feared, the kid we've been worried about all along that we're missing something, we have been. There's an infection and we're able to detect it in the blood, what we call bacteremia. So no doubt this patient is septic. The good thing about having a positive blood culture is we can pick an antibiotic specific to that bacteria. So get them on the best treatment. And we need to keep a close eye on the patient with observations and blood tests to make sure we're supporting the organs. And therefore that will give us time for his own immune system and for the antibiotics to be able to treat the infection. Hey, all right. That kid is eventually gonna die. Whether it's today, tomorrow or a month from now there's nothing i can do nothing works now his parents want to talk to me what am i supposed to tell them peter lived a good long seven years seven years man it's not fair i hate this place i hate this job it's, it's i can't do it anymore i i'm done i'm done, I'm done. <sighs> wow and I think there's something in the nature of who we pick to go into medicine that they're particularly susceptible to this. If you think about it, to become a doctor, you kind of need to perform well at high school. You need to be clever academically throughout your whole life. And that means getting the answers right to things. And back then in high school and in university, there are correct answers. And if you study hard, you'll get the right answer and you'll get the rewards. But in clinical medicine, in seeing patients, even if you get everything right, the outcome isn't always the best thing. And that can be really hard to adjust to. And the modern demands as well in medicine is that you can be pulled all over the place and you can't achieve everything. You can't do the best for every patient you see. You just have to prioritize things and you might not be used to that kind of working. And if you're used to being the best all the time, the fall can be extremely high. And so therefore it can hit you a lot harder. And this is what I'm seeing in Dr. Murdoch here. He is a superstar, a fantastic doctor. And so the only thing that's gonna defeat him is his mentality. But maybe it's not about being the best. Maybe it's about finding the little things that get you through the day. There you go, I completely agree. I guess in the end, it's about surviving any way you can. See you tomorrow. Oh my God, so he actually quit medicine. I've had quite a few of my colleagues quit medicine, particularly at the moment because it is so horrific working in the NHS. So that is realistic, people, all that time training. Okay, it's not wasted because there are lots of transferable skills. But still, you want people to stay in the profession. You need to treat them well. But the only thing I would say here, and they probably didn't have time to tell the whole story, is it's generally not one-off incidents that would make people turn their back on it. It's generally chronic stress. So the stress of the job bleeding into your life and affecting your life and making you burn out, that tends to be the thing that people end up having enough rather than sort of a one-off episode like this. But as I said, people leaving the profession, sadly, so many people are doing that at the moment. So there you have it, another brilliantly entertaining episode of Scrubs. And they always do it, but this one in particular, treading that line between the kind of joy and privilege of medicine and the tough challenges that come along with it. In terms of realism, I thought this episode was really spot on, particularly with the character of Dr. Nick Murdoch. I could certainly relate to working with people like that and certainly relate to people who are absolutely brilliant doctors figuring out medicine isn't for them, which, you know, there's no shame in that. So to give it a rating, I'm gonna give this one 
I think it was pretty solid. I'm gonna give it an eight out of 10. It's right up there for me. The WTF moment in this episode was definitely Todd letting a fart off in the operating theater. I mean, okay, that's one thing doing that, but then not admitting <laughs> you've done that and then looking to see if the bowel had perforated. I think that's, uh, <laughs> that's something Todd could reflect on. So I hope you've enjoyed my thoughts on this episode. As always, if there's anything I've missed or anything you wanna add, then please leave a comment down below. And if you have enjoyed this video, give it a like and consider subscribing too. It just leaves me to say thank you again for all the support on the channel. I hope you're all well and I'll be back soon.